Welcome to the Writer Dojo with your host, Steve Diamond. Yellow. And Larry Korea. I didn't think of anything again. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Today's episode, Urban Fantasy. <laughs> Before we click the clicker, I was like, what are we going to talk about? Oh, yeah. And then I just, my brain went blank. Yeah. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Writer Dojo. Um, glad to have you back with us again, as usual. Um, today, Larry, it's been a while since we've talked about like specific genres. Yeah, we've done, we've done genre episodes before. I think the last time we talked about horror. Yeah. Writing horror and like the tips and tricks for writing mm-hmm. horror. And, uh, we decided we're going to do that again. Yeah. And, uh, this time we're going to tackle, which is kind of a no brainer, I guess, cause this is what my, most of my career is, is urban fantasy. Yeah. Like what's urban fantasy and how, how do you go about doing it? Now, urban fantasy is cool. Man, I love urban fantasy so much. Yeah, and it's, I kind of, I, I love it, and it's it's what pays for my house, but I hate the name. <laughs> I'll be honest. I hate, we talked about genre before and where it comes from, but the name urban fantasy to me is a complete misnomer. I kind of like the term contemporary fantasy. Sure. Um, just because basically, guys, what we're talking about here is, you know, we've talked about fantasy before, and that's, you know, we got these fantastic magical elements or monstrous elements. Some other world. Some other worldly elements yeah. stuck into our world. Um, or, or I'm sorry, that, is, or, or, that would that would be regular fantasy, but yeah. like contemporary fantasy, it's stuck in our it's on in our world yeah. that we know it's, today. It's those fantastical elements shoved into our world. Yes, yeah, so we take the earth that we know, and then you change something. Mm-hmm. Maybe uh, you know, maybe magic was reintroduced in the 1800s. Oh uh, yeah, that's what I did by in Grimnoir. In, in Grimnoir. Uh, you know. and so it, it I, I took. It would have been contemporary fantasy if I had been alive in the 1930s, right. I guess. Um, so Monster Hunter, I basically, the, the magical premise there is monsters are real. Mm-hmm. And which is a premise that's been used a million times. You know, I, I think, um, and, and I straddle the line on this with, with a lot of the horror that I write. Because horror and urban fantasy have a very, um, they've been together for a lot. Yeah, they're they're peanut butter and chocolate. We talked about yeah. that in uh the, in the sometimes it's just episode. and sometimes it's just peanut butter flavored chocolate. Like yeah, you know what I mean. Like the the old analogy that I use, um, and and this is a gross, um, this is just a gross like blanket statement. And that's um, when it comes to horror, um, your characters, no matter how much they succeed, um, they're probably going to fail at the end. And then for urban fantasy, it's kind of like. Well, no matter how bad things are getting for the characters, they're probably going to succeed in the end. Yeah. You know, but urban fantasy really is, is basically just the new version of horror. It's just, it's just horror that's been supplanted in the, in the tone's been changed a little bit. In a way, because if you think about Monster Hunter, what did I start with? I started with a bunch of horror movie tropes. B-movie horror monster tropes, yeah. I took B-movie horror characters. I took Mm -hmm. B-movie horror monsters and situations, and I stuck them into a book and just kind of like fluffed them up with a lot of gun nuttery. Uh, Why is my stuff not horror? And I've said this before, it's the capability of the characters. Sure. My characters aren't hopeless. My characters are butt kickers. Well, and it's the focus, right? Yeah. You're, You're, there's much more humor in your stuff. Um, the attitude is a lot, is a, is a bit, um, I'd say more hopeful and more lively. Yeah. Instead Um, of survival, it's about winning. It's like, it's like, we don't just want to survive the night. We want to win the night. With extreme prejudice. Yeah. With extreme violence and high explosives (laughs) and, uh, and lots and lots of one liners and, uh, you know, face punching. Well, and I think that that's the beauty of, of urban fantasy. So Urban, you know, w- with urban fantasy being what it is, um, again, the, the, the quick and dirty term is magic in our contemporary world. And the other one that's on the other side of this, we talk about how it's one side, it's horror and then urban fantasy. The other side of urban fantasy is paranormal, paranormal romance. romance. Yep. Now, paranormal, paranormal romance. And, uh, we actually, I have specific people I want to have on as guests to talk about this one who are oh, way yeah. better at it yeah, than us. Great. Um, but paranormal romance is kind of the same exact tropes as horror and urban fantasy. And it's once again, usually our contemporary world. However, it tends to be romantically directed as opposed to action or dread Mm -hmm. related. No, I think, I think that's a really good way of describing it, Larry. You know, horror is focused on the dread. Um, urban fantasy is focused on the action. And then paranormal romance is focused well on the romance. Yeah. 
you know, and I, and I think that that pretty much distinguishes them because they all use the same things. Yeah, exactly. So we're like, um, if you have a vampire and you're like just trying to survive the vampire horror, yeah. if you're going to blow the vampire up, uh, it's urban fantasy. And if you're going to have sexy time with the vampire, it's paranormal romance. Right. Or mummy or, you or, know, or, or, or werewolf or whatever yeah. it is. Hopefully not zombie. That's just gross. Okay. So if there's a shirtless guy on the cover, it's probably paranormal romance. If it's a shirtless guy with a, you know, bloody ax murdering somebody, it's probably urban fantasy. And if it's a shirtless guy being killed, it's probably, <laughs> it's probably horror. horror, you know, <laughs> or hot chick, depending on who you're, you're right. marketing to, you know, and I, I, I'm not one of those guys who gets all butthurt about, oh no, this cover sexualizes women. Like whatever. I just want to sell books. Man. I know. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm yeah. trusted the marketing well. people. <laughs> so, so what is it about urban fantasy, Larry? I mean, and I mean, I, I don't think either of us really sought out to write urban fantasy. We just wrote a cool story that, that appealed to us. And then it turned out that that's what people are marketing it as urban fantasy. I'll be honest. Days. When I started, I'd never heard the term. Yeah. When I wrote monster hunter, and I was pitching it and I, I was try, first pitching it to agents and publishing houses. I had no flipping clue and I didn't know what to call it. And so I was like, uh, it's action horror. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't know what to call it. I, I never even heard of the term urban fantasy. I didn't know about it until I was working at the bookstore. Um, and you know, I, I at the bookstores, I tend to recommend, I, I would tend to recommend a lot of, um, like mystery thrillers, you, you know, your Michael Connelly's basically. Oh, yeah. Um, you yeah. know, Bosch type stuff. Fantastic stuff. Um, and then I would recommend, you know, like dark, dark, dark epic fantasy, you know, your Steven Erickson's and stuff like that. Glenn Cook, jazz like that. Right. Or, or heroic stuff like David Gemmel. Um, and then, uh, uh, this is when I took a recommendation from one of my regulars at the bookstore and he said, Steve, he's like, have you read this Jim Butcher guy? And I said, no. I mean, I've, I've obviously stocked his books on the shelves. I, I mean, to date you. Just to give you a date on this, I think this was book six. Oh yeah, in the Justin series. Eighteen. I think we're now? at eighteen. Eighteen. I think. Um, yeah. So this was quite a while ago. This was like dead beat or proven guilty, right around there. Okay. Might have been. I think I was around for both at the bookstore. He said, "No, dude, you have to read this." I said, well, "What is it?" And he said, "Oh, well, it's urban fantasy." I'm like, "I don't know what that means, dude." <laughs> and he said, "Oh, it's fantasy set in our world." And he said, "Oh." He's like, yeah, dude's a, dude's a wizard in Chicago solving crime with monsters and stuff. I'm like, well, that sounds awesome. So I picked it up. Um, and right around the same time, um, I, I read the, the books that were out at the time and I loved them. Um, and then I started looking for other things in the genre. And that's when I found the Nightside series by Simon R. Green, another mm -hmm. main author. Um, although I think those were published by Ace. Um, well, and then also uh, Misty Lackey did the Serrated Edge Elf. See, I, I never read any of those ones. Because like Jim Butcher is kind of the big dog. He's the, he's like the godfather. He's not Jim's not the father of the genre. No. Jim didn't start it. No. There was urban fantasy long before Jim. Uh, but Jim, I think, is the single biggest influence who brought it more mainstream. Yeah. Uh, and then of course Laurel on the paranormal romance. Yeah, side see, and then Laurel is like I would say she Laurel is the godmother of paranormal romance. Uh, obviously, was there other stuff like that before her? Oh sure. yeah, sure. Oh, Anne Rice was the big huge one oh, of like sure. our youth. That was more horror bent though. Yeah, see, that was horror, but it was also sexy horror. Whereas, oh yeah, sexy time horror. Which is interesting because when you look at Laurel stuff, when she first started out with her Anita Blake stuff, it was it more, was more that straight way. up urban fantasy yeah. for the first like three or f two, two, three books. Uh, I don't remember. Then she went more paranormal romance mm -hmm. you know and the thing is so i would say is that jim i would say jim is the godfather of urban fantasy and laurel's the godmother of of paranormal romance sure and so i'm like the bastard uh bastard uh weird uncle that like i don't know i don't know what the hell i am <laughs> cousin i'm some weird cousin you're like that disowned cousin that that well, every now and then shows up to family reunions well also it's too interesting that's why i say like i don't like the term urban fantasy because my stuff's not even urban well, you had that review that one time, um, where the person was talking about, um, oh gosh, what was it? They were talking about how, um, how your, oh, how did it go? But you were talking about how your stuff isn't even really urban fantasy because it's all set in rural Alabama. Um, I think they were talking about like flyover states and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I write, oh, I definitely write the flyover states, of, which is funny because I've had scenes set all over the world and all these different mm -hmm. cities and places, but primarily the people are based out of rural Alabama, 
which is a place I love. And and uh, see, there there's more of a there's actually more of a horror lean in that mindset because there's more mystery in in, in the rural area. Oh man, you like know? you go out in, like where I live. Oh yeah, like like I it's dark and quiet. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it is real dark and quiet yeah. where I'm at, you know? I mean, I, I'm rural, rural. Uh, well, I say I'm not too rural. I mean, I'm, I got a big forest just south of me. I yeah. should say that. Um, but it's pretty quiet where I'm at. And so anyway, my, my original question basically yeah, well, was, yeah, we went off was on there. why did you, why did you start writing what you wanted to write? Oh, see, that's the funny thing too, is cause like, once again, not even knowing that urban fantasy was a thing. Uh, I, I just were like wanted to have fun with horror movie tropes. And most of those are set in our modern world, right? It's the world that people know, which we'll get into like the nuts and bolts of writing this stuff in the second half, yeah. really. But, but one of the big things there was, it's really easy to write the world, you know, and only change one thing Yeah, and introduce monsters or introduce magic or introduce wizards or introduce whatever, you know, um, whatever the weird thing is in your urban fantasy universe. Plus, you got to think of it this way. For your readers, there's a lower barrier of entry too. Like, oh, okay, that's a good point. So think about it. So if you're reading an epic fantasy novel, like um, you set in some magical world, you've got all this establishing stuff. And it's a whole skill of how you're going to unveil that stuff in a way that is interesting to the reader without being info dumpy and boring or confusing. Well, that, that's one of the biggest barriers to entry to Steven Erickson, who you know oh I love. Oh, my gosh. You, you know I love. Well, I adore Steven Erickson. Well, and, and like Mazelon, like, like takes you and like, hey, I'm just going to throw you in the deep end of the pool. Well, that, that's how Jim Mintz described it And hold it the once. cinder block while you yeah. tread water. He said, yeah, he said it was it was having your legs tied together with a cinder block and then thrown into the ocean and saying, hey, swim to shore, buddy. Yeah, like, it's like there's no flipping clue what's going on. Mm. And so, I mean, honestly, if you're in a, in, an impatient reader, it's not for you. Like no. you're going to be like kicked out within seconds because you're like, who are these 15 people I just met who I have no idea how, what the context is here. Well, and then, but on the urban fantasy side, to your point. Well, it's a wizard in Chicago. It's like, it's like, oh yeah. I mean, even if I haven't been to Chicago, I've been to a big city. Yeah. Um, or I at least have seen memes about how terrible it is there. Well, I mean, how many urban fantasy novels are set in Los Angeles? All of them. Yeah. Oh, I mean, so many of them. New York or New York City. Oh yeah, it's always it's always it's the it's the coast, right? Well, it's like any TV show, right? Every crime TV show happens in New York, Vegas, or LA. And why do they do that? Because they're it's they're well established areas that people are familiar with. Well, it's also with. where these people film, or they film in Toronto now. I was going to say they film in Canada. Yeah. yeah, though I have seen uh, in recent years more stuff set in Atlanta. Oh yeah, you know for that for makes sense. for for well the south yeah the south that makes sense. Well, plus when the dirty south is a great yeah, place it's for. Awesome. Uh, you know, it's awesome. But honestly, uh, so like, so when people are picking out their settings, so when I was picking out a setting for Monster Hunter, why did I go with rural Alabama? Because at that point in my life, I lived in a handful of places. And one of them was Alabama. One of them was Alabama. Yep. I had lived in California and Utah with the other two. Mm -hmm. And I looked at California. I was like, you know what? I was so sick of all fiction being set in California. I'm not filming a Hollywood TV show. There's, there's no reason for me to set it. Plus, honestly, I'm from there. I hate it. I left for a reason. I did not want to write fiction there. And so I said, nope, no California. The other place was Utah. And I was like, you know, I'm writing like, like monster explosions and craziness. And eh, I mean, Utah is fun and all. It's a great state. And I've actually had, I've actually set some monster hunter stuff in Utah. Oh yeah. Dugway. Specifically Dugway. So yeah. if you've ever been, if you've lived in Utah, if you've been out to Dugway, you know why I would set monster stuff there. Yeah. Dugway's crazy. Um, but so Alabama was the third logical choice. And it's kind of like, it's got a ton of like fun culture, weird stuff. And uh, I'm kind of an honorary Southerner. <laughs> and part of me was like, you know, Southerners don't get enough cool stuff in books. You almost never see a heroic Southern character. Southern characters are always like dumb redneck hicks, backwoods. And I was like, nah, man, I'm going to, I'm going to take those guys. And I'm going like, to have some fun with them. I'm going to make some heroes. I'm going to make some badasses. When I, when I was writing Residue, the reason I set it, um, I set it a little bit north of Sacramento to start. Um, Which is actually an area that you don't see That you hardly see anything in. And you knew um, it really well. And, and I knew it pretty well. Um, and, then, and then the sequel, Parasite, um, it's set completely in Sacramento. Because you never see, you never see anything in Sacramento. Except they're like, oh yeah, we sent it to the lab in Sacramento. That's like all you see in, in any show, right? <laughs> And then, but, but conversely, so I, so the story I wrote for Monster Hunter, okay, the gift, where did I set that story? Mexico. Northern Mexico. Yep. Where I'd lived. Yep. 
in fact, that church, that's the, the terrible, horrible church where bad things happen in the story. I like, I know that church. Well, there you go. I See? mean, I walked by it quite that, frequently. That's the beauty of urban fantasy. Yeah. You know, you need to get some of these guys where they're like, they'll straight up use real geography. Uh, um, for their urban fantasy scenes. Absolutely. I totally do. Which is funny because Jim Butcher is just one of the things he gets yelled at by Chicago residents. Oh, yeah. Because Jim's not from Chicago. And I think I think when Jim wrote it, because like, I think he's from Missouri. And so when he wrote it, like, he was just like, he just picked a city. He's like, what's a big, cool city? He didn't know anything about Chicago. So he, I guess he messes up his geography all the time. Whatever. But only people from Chicago realize it. Yeah. The rest of us were like, well, you know. Oh, gosh. I In in uh, in, in, in uh, the sequel to Residue, uh, in Parasite, I have, um, I have where a, a murder location takes place. It's in this super sketchy part where my favorite Mexican restaurant is <laughs> uh, called El Noviero in in uh, in Sacramento. It's off of Franklin Boulevard. It's the super sketchiest place. Like it's it's super horrible, um, but super. I mean, one of my favorite Mexican places. Well, all the good Mexican places are. They're like, always in sketchy. Like, they're always in like, sketchy neighborhoods, right? Well, except for Bandito's Taco Truck. Which is they don't they can they choose they you. can choose where they go. Okay, if you're in Utah, eat at Bandidos. Oh yeah, tell them Stephen Larry sent you. That's right. Um, he so I love that. I, I love the reason why I love kind of the urban fantasy type stuff, and is because you can put those real world tastes in it. And if you're a reader and you happen to be from that area and you get and and the author gets a, a detail right you know like like you know like me having you know where where the restaurant is and stuff and the type of people that are hanging out outside of it the readers who have been in that area it's almost like they're in on the joke with you yeah. you know and then they're like all right well, cool it's, it's like nice, michael conley yeah. novel set in los angeles oh man well he was a beat writer yeah and so he know he freaking knows LA. Yeah. So when he writes when he writes LA, you feel it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Which is funny because like well, d use your word specifically. You feel it. Yeah. Because he, he puts so much care and emotion into his work that like I mean he he really nails that noir feel in a lot of his novels. When I've spent enough time there, it. I've spent enough time in that city that I'm like, oh yeah, I've seen this sleaze hole. <laughs> this, this, <laughs> this is sounds familiar. <laughs> No, Conway nails that. And so it's funny because it's not urban fantasy. It's, it's, uh, it's real. It's thrillers or cop, cop, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what do you, I guess it'd be thriller. Um, it's just detective stories, detective story. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but he just absolutely nails it. And to urban fantasy, you can do the same thing. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to come back and, uh, what we want to do besides just geeking out about how much we love urban fantasy, because we can do that for hours. Yeah. We're pretty dorky. Um, and and I and, and I'm sure y'all can hear our enthusiasm for it. Um, we want to come back and we want to give you some like nuts and bolts writing advice on how you can accomplish this, um, and 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 some of the tips and tricks that we've learned. So we'll be right back. A half century old curse lies over the small community of Bridgewater. Ever since Sarah Chase died in a car accident during a teen angst driven game of chicken back in 1962. She perished in the back seat of a 1961 Impala, accompanied by a group of boys who called themselves the Big Four. She screamed as the car careened through a guardrail and plunged into the icy river water beneath. The four boys survived. Sarah did not. Teenagers still race and party at the Milvian Bridge where Sarah's car went over, especially on the anniversary of her death, in hopes of catching a glimpse of her unsettled ghost. But the partying teenagers of Bridgewater don't know that in life Sarah belonged to a group of teenage girls who practiced witchcraft. They don't know that Sarah seeks to use her powers from the grave to avenge her unrequited vendetta. They don't know that Stan Corliss, the driver of the Impala that terrible night and the unpronounced protector of Bridgewater, has passed away, freeing Sarah to unleash her anger. Dead Girl by Craig Nybo is available on Amazon and is free for Kindle Unlimited subscribers. Pick up your copy today. Welcome back. All right. We spent the first half of the episode, Larry, geeking out about urban fantasy because we can't help it. We just, we both love it. Yeah. It's so much freaking fun. But I like going nuts and bolts too and like helping people try to write this stuff. Mm -hmm. Or also one thing we mentioned at the break, we were talking about this is, uh, is why you should write urban fantasy. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things we thought about was our last episode, we did a Q&A 
uh, where we talked about uh, a fella who was worried about writing too long. Yeah. And honestly, if you worry about that and you worry about world building, urban fantasy is a wonderful way to dabble in and to get started in writing. You know, just like we talked about in the first part with, because of urban fantasy, it's in a familiar world. You don't have to explain everything. And there's a, a, a much lower barrier to entry to the reader. Likewise, it can be for the author as well. Yeah, like if you need to be terse, like if I'm describing like a fantastical mode of transportation, I have to describe it. But if they're getting in a car and driving, they're getting in a car and driving, and you don't have to worry about explaining that to your readers. Well, like Jim Butcher, right? You know, we'll, we'll use Jim Butcher examples because he is he is our um, he is one of our favorite people and the big dog and the big dog in the in the in the country when it comes to well in the world when it comes to urban fantasy. But he's also written fantasy. Oh okay. yeah, very okay. good too. He's written very good fantasy. He wrote, in, in, and I want to talk specifically about The Aeronauts Winless. I love that book. Great book. Um, I want more of them. I do too. I'm very excited for more of them. Um, but that book, he has to spend so much um, word count basically explaining how the airships work, how the crystals that affect buoyancy and stuff like that work. Whereas in urban fantasy, he's like, yeah, I get in this beetle. Yeah, Harry and it works. Volkswagen sometimes. Yeah, and everybody in the world is like, "Oh yeah," it's like, "Oh yeah, we've all had that car. We've all had that car." Yeah, yeah. So, so that's one where urban fantasy is really good. Now, and this brings up another point, though. It's like talk about technology. Yeah, the biggest mistake I made, Monster Hunter. The if I could go back in time, my biggest rookie mistake in MHI was I plugged one date mm. i got one date in the timeline so that anchors it within a specific exact window of time for for political issues for um for technology for everything and the thing is it's a continuing series it's now eight eight books in working on number nine with multiple spinoffs it's one thing to have spinoffs set in specific time ranges and i could like so the the memoirs books are in the 1980s if you're writing a period piece specifically that's a different animal. works great yeah but this other one the kind of the assumption on urban fantasy is it's taking place contemporary to us right, right now so I have since ignored that date that I established in the first book. I, I can't do anything about it. It's there. It sucks. But the other thing that gets you is like when you're writing urban fantasy, stuff becomes dated quickly. Yeah. So technology, like Owen has a Blackberry in the beginning. <laughs> Why does Owen, uh, so for those of you that don't know, that was a form of phone. Yeah. That was a type of cell phone back in the olden oh. days. <laughs> Rest in peace, Blackberry. They were pretty cool. They had a little trackball on them that rolled around. I mean, it was like the businessman's phone of choice for a while. Why did Owen have one? Because that's the phone I had issued to me at the company I worked yep. at. Yep. Because I had the same one. Yep. Yep. So that was back in those days. Uh -huh. But that is now immediately dated. Yeah. Um, and so it's one of those things. So watch out for stuff like that. Well, Monster it's no Hunter, different. Well, I was going to say, Monster Hunter being so gun nutty. Oh, yeah. I'm dated on the gun nut stuff, too, because gun stuff evolves. But also, the only people who are going to notice that is a very small and select group. Well, and, and as you write further on in your series, you can get around that just by saying something to the effect of, yeah, there were newer guns out, but Owen was really fond of this one. Well, and then um, plus, as the series has gone on, I've... I've kept buying more additional guns <laughs> for the characters. Well, that's how you get the write-off. Well, yeah. Well, and also it's just, that way it's research. Baby. I actually shoot them all. Everything, all the guns, <laughs> uh, all the guns that appear in this series, I've shot most of them in yeah. real life, you know? Well, that was the discussion we were having at your house the other day when we were shooting that bullpup. You're like, okay, how far can I shoot this? Cause I need to put this in a book. I know. I was like, I was like, yeah, I started, <laughs> I could ring still with that thing at 300 now. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. I, I, I got, I got, I have a red dot on it. I'm going blind. Um, so, so anyway, one of the, one of the interesting things and, and urban fantasy shares a lot, um, when it comes to, um, when it comes to like detective stories, you oh, know, yeah. your, your, your modern day thrillers. There. And, um, I remember reading some old, I, I love, I love detective stories. Everyone knows this now. We, both you and I were freaking nerds when it comes to detective stories. Um, and I freaking love reading that stuff. However. You go back and you read, you know, we're, we're kind of spoiled with the current series of Bosch because it's, it's super modern. So good. Yeah. Um, but when that first book came out, I mean, people are still using pay phones and, you know, cell phones. When did they come out? Early nineties? Um, I'm trying to think when the Black so, Echo came out. I think something was, like early nineties. I think it was in the nineties. Like, yeah. Black Echo and then Black Ice, they both came out right around pretty close therein. Um, both 
freaking terrific novels. But phone booths were a phone thing? Phone booths. I mean, just the way that communication is held, the way that, I mean... They weren't sending emails. No. And, and so all of that really dates it. And so the trouble is nowadays, when you go back to read, um, like, so like, uh, one of the authors that I, that I liked and my, and, and my wife liked a little bit more than I did was Jonathan Kellerman. He's another mystery author. And we started, she started reading him. She liked him, but he'd been around for a long time. So she went and picked up some of his backlist. I'm sure he appreciated the check, got the backlist. And she started reading it and was completely thrown out because it took like these detective stories were taking place in the eighties. And so it's like, oh yeah, he put a dime in the, you know, in the, in the phone or in the, um, in the pay phone to make a call. And, and it, it just didn't work at the time because she wasn't reading it under the, under the, um, I guess the, the assumption that this was being written as a period piece. It's not like when someone reads Grim Noir right? You, oh, you yeah. pick up Grim Noir understanding that it's set in a very specific time yeah, frame. Yeah, you open the book, it says 1932. Right. And so the scene is set. Yeah. But when you just pick up urban fantasy or, um, or whatever, or, uh, detective thrillers or whatever, and you just pick it up and all of a sudden the anachronisms start, start yeah. pulling you out. Well, and not necessarily anachronisms, but, but the, the time, the time anchors start pulling you out. That, that can be really hard for people. Well, one big part of the problem with this too is just one of logistics. So I write a book, it takes me about six months. Sure. Okay. Or a lot of writers take you a year. And let's say that I wrote my first book in 2007. Mm -hmm. So I write it as a contemporary fantasy in 2007. Well, now the thing is we're now in the year of 2022 and I am writing book nine of this series. Yeah. So it's taking you longer to write the series than... <laughs> No, so how long have the how how much time has the has passed for these characters? Not nine years. Yeah. Versus how much time has passed in real life? More than nine years. Exactly. So you gotta be super careful with like what you want to pin down. And you can get away with some stuff. It's just but sure. also a lot of this stuff be real careful with contemporary political issues. Oh gosh, yeah. Because the stuff that is contemporary and oh, hot man. right now to talk about is going to seem real dated to a reader who picks that book up in four years. I mean, you and I have talked about the uh, the the dying polar bears in Antarctica. Oh you know, yeah, because that was the biggest thing for a long time in sci-fi was dying polar bears. You yeah. know, global warming was like mm -hmm. the topic of literally every single book, especially if it won an award. Uh, it yeah. had it had dying polar bears in it or robot rape or robot rape. That was the other one. Like, oh my gosh, what was the like every robot got raped. Oh my yeah. gosh. Quit raping robots, people. Gosh. It's a terrible epidemic. Um, so be real careful, like on, on getting on what the hotness thing is yeah. uh, like in monster hunter. I, it's funny too, because this series has been going on for a long time, but I get political, like I'd have politicians would be involved, usually involving like monster rights or how they're dealing with the end of the world. I never use any real politicians. No. Yeah. But the thing is, the funny thing is I've had people assume I was using, like the president was obviously this real life politician and they would take whatever their personal vendetta was against that president. They would get the wrong president because they're reading this several years after it came out and it was not the, who was president when I wrote it. Mm -hmm. I had no idea who the next one was going to be. And so like, well, this is a thinly veiled attack on so-and-so is like. Dude, I didn't even know who that guy was when I wrote this book, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, and some of this, a little bit of this, you, you can't, you can't ever expect that, um, that all your readers are going to be rational. I mean, I read a review, whose book was it? I read a review where I might've been Rothman where the, the person said, um, like how, how, like. I'm giving you one star for this review because the book is apparently set in 2021, but um, you didn't mention COVID once in oh, it. Oh, I remember that. Was that Rothman? That. No, it who was, was that? Oh, who was that? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, I can't remember right now, but yeah, there's the dumbest review I've ever and seen. And everyone's like, he's like, I wrote it like in 2018. How am I supposed to know what was going to happen yeah, four how, years from now? How dare you not go into the future and predict a global pandemic that yeah. literally nobody you know, it didn't exist. Yeah. I mean, if, if everyone had a crystal ball, one, we'd be rich. And two, you and I wouldn't have released a book about pseudo Russia invading another country, you know, when Putin declared war. Yeah. You know, we, we would have thought about these things. Which is really sad since it's, the empire of Kolokovia is not good guys. No, no, there's very few good guys in that <laughs> book. Pretty terrible people. 
No, so you got to be real careful with contemporary political issues. Um, I'm trying to think of what other nuts and bolts I give her. Well, not just political issues, but I mean social issues, social, political, social, and um, and fads. Oh my gosh, nothing feels more dated than going back and reading a book from the early 2000s. Is hung up on like, you know, whatever the latest, uh, whatever the latest Da Vinci Code clone was. Oh my gosh, yeah, those because we had so many of those. There was that was, that was a whole big genre there for a while. Mm-hmm. But like, it's funny because for a while there, like every villain was a thinly veiled Dick Cheney. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So just be real careful getting hung up on that stuff, guys. Or if, you, if you're going to do that, be clever in a way that that doesn't like overcome the story. So people are just going to read it and move on. You know, if you don't need to go super specific, don't go super specific. Just, you know, get it what you need out there and move. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're writing a very specifically like a political thriller. Oh, then by all means, you then, have to. Then you have to do that. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about urban fantasy. Urban fantasy is about fantasy. Well, and on that don't note, limit, don't limit yourself. When you're introducing fantastical elements into your world, think about how common that fantastical element is and how it would affect the world. So, so that's a great, that's a great point, Larry. That's an interesting example. So Charlene Harris. Okay? Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, wonderful person. Um, Charlene Harris with her, with her true blood series. Um, what's it called? Southern vampires. I think is what it's called. I think so. Um, so one of her big concepts, it's that, it's that, you know, vampires are real and everyone knows they're real. Yes. Yeah, so it's like, actually that's one, that's an interesting one because it's like very much open. It's super open, but she brings in w- really interesting things in it. Now I read the majority of that series just out of curiosity. I am not the target audience of it. Um, but I read it more as an intellectual exercise and I'm glad I did. You know why? Because she did some really interesting things and it leads directly to the comment that you just made. It's how one thing impacts the world as in general. Remember some of our early, earlier conversations when we were talking about character and world building and how, if this, then what, yep. right? Exactly. And so if vampires are around, then what, what does that mean? Um, and, and she took it in terms of economics, which I actually really liked. And it's in terms of true blood, which is the, um, I think that's what the, it's like the vampire, I think that's it's what the it's substitute called, right? drink. It's, yeah. It's, it's the synthetic blood Yeah, and there's a whole market around it. And then there's black markets in relating to, to vampires blood that is being used for all sorts of other, you know, sexy time things. And so like the idea there, and, and I, and I love that she did this and I love that Charlene Harris put thought into this, even though this is, that series is not my thing. I love how much thought she put into, into the economics within an urban fantasy world. Yeah. So that's one too, is like you think about, okay, so you got your contemporary world that you're, is your starting point, right? Yeah. And then you introduce a fantastical element. How open is society about mm-hmm. this thing? Is it a secret? So, cause the more secret you keep it, the more you can stick to the real world. Right. It, the more open it is, the more it changes everything. Yeah. So well, like in Monster Hunter, monsters existing is pretty secret. However, it's kept that way by force. Yeah. And I, I have a lot and of fun with that. And there's an entire entity, you know, the MCB, that their entire job is to make sure that it doesn't go public. So it's funny. So when I do sometimes get into like contemporary uh, issues, it's more how this thing that just happened a couple years ago was like actually something else. Yeah. So that thing you saw on the news, it was actually this. Right. And there are some, there are some, uh, uh, other, uh, fantasies that do, or urban fantasies that do that where they go and they get historical events. Oh, of course. And they say, well, this historical event was really this. Oh, that's, that's huge, all over the place. Huge well you can draw on, yeah. million story ideas. Um, you can have a lot of fun with conspiracy theories. Oh yeah. Like, oh, this thing is a conspiracy theory. Well, in my book, it can be a real thing. Yeah. You know, and we mock it as a conspiracy theory. That way the people who believe it aren't taken serious. Mm -hmm. I do that in a lot of Monster Hunter Mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, well, you know, only wackadoos believe in that kind of thing. Well, and, and I think that for, for the, the burgeoning writers out there, the ones who, who want to write urban fantasy or write these sort of stories that are going to be marketed as urban fantasy, I guess I should say, um, Think about all the stuff that Larry and I are talking about in terms of nuts and bolts. Um, what is it, what is it that you think is really neat that could, that you would change in our world that could have a dramatic impact and then start thinking about, again, going back to our nuts and bolts, um, episodes of earlier in terms of character and world building, if this, then what? So, you know, if, 
unicorns are real, then what? What does that mean? And, and you know, Larry, you know, Larry started talking about some of the, the really good questions to ask, like, how open is it? How many people know about this? How rare are they? How, what, um, is there, is there any, um, is there any issues within this world that, um, that directly impact them or that they impact? Well, like my biggest danger with Monster Hunter is I have to be real careful. I love doing these big world threatening events, but if I make it too big, then everyone would know. And I've also got to be careful anytime I do a period piece that I can't have anything in the period that would, it would have changed the world too much today. Right. Which is a huge danger. Um, and it's like, no, nah, I can't, I can't be that destructive or I got to have some sort of cover. You gotta have a way to cover it up. And now as time goes on, I, of course, I, I am able to stretch that more and more and it's just what the readers are willing to give me. So when I'm this far into a series, I get a lot of leeway. Yeah. But when you're starting out, you got to be a little more careful with that too, as far as making your world plausible and believable. That's a delicate balance, guys. Yeah. So here, here's what I think, here's what I think people should do, Larry. For all of those out there who want to write urban fantasy, um, and for those who don't, but I still think this is a good exercise. I want, what I want people to do is kind of theory craft for a minute. I want them to think about our world, okay, as it is right now, whatever. And then introduce some fantastical element and then start going through the thought exercise of, okay, I'm introducing this weird fantastical. It doesn't have to be serious guys. Like, like freaking throw a dart at a board and figure out something and then just go through the exercise of, okay, if, um, orangutans were actually vampires, then what, you know, I don't know. Um, if, if all mummies were sexy, what does this mean? I don't know. So start asking yourself the questions that Larry and I, um, keep keep tossing back and forth to each other in this episode and as we have in previous episodes. There's a million ideas out there because one time me and John Ringo were having a conversation at Liberty Con just sitting around and I don't even know who came up with this, but just on the fact of that nuclear power is not real. Huh. Nuclear power is actually a demon that they we, we capture and we enslave in those big concrete things and they have a demon in there that they're like torturing this demon and they keep it angry to produce all this heat en energy. And that's actually where the term breeder reactor comes from is that was the one that the demon mom that made the baby demons that he took to other reactors. And this was just a random conversation, you know, it's like there's, there's all sorts of endless possibilities of like fantastical explanations for stuff. <laughs> all right, guys, that's, that's all the time we have for you today. But yeah, look, go through that a thought exercise, apply it to your, you know, maybe your character is the one with the magic, or maybe he's the one that, that the magic influences. Think through all these questions and start and start tackling it. You can tackle the urban fantasy from the character point of view or from the world point of view, like we've or like Larry and I have talked about in previous episodes. And I think when you start doing this, you're really gonna get some really cool ideas. And even if you don't use them for anything, whatever, maybe it'll it'll help you think in a different way. And then you'll start creating really cool and interesting fiction. All right, that's all the time we have for you today. See you next time. Writer Dojo is Steve Diamond and Larry Correa. Produced by Jack Wilder and Bear and Hair Studios. Theme song, Word Mercenaries by Craig Nivo. New episodes come out every Wednesday wherever you stream your content. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can help support us by going to anchor.fm slash writer dojo by leaving a five-star rating and review, and by helping to spread the word. To advertise on the Writer Dojo, email ads at writerdojo.com. All questions and comments can be emailed to questions at writerdojo.com. You know, only wackadoos believe in that kind of thing.